Let's just open a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you we can come around your word. And God, we just know that, uh, God, you've got good things in store for us. And you are such a great God. Uh, We are so grateful that we can be in your presence, that your presence is here with us this morning, that you're already moving by your Holy Spirit, even in through the praise and the worship. And God, you continue to move through the word. Holy Spirit, I pray that your word would not turn void, but to do what you want it to do this morning. God, not in our heads, but in our hearts. God, let our hearts be open to receive what you want to say to us. Let us be responsive, open, receptive to the leading of your Holy Spirit today. So God, we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Good on you. That's it. Praise God. Well, last week we talked about topic and it was give him praise. We were talking about praise and why we need to praise God, the benefits of praise. We opened up and talked about from the book of Luke 17 was the first scripture. And we're just going to do a bit of a recap for those that weren't here last week. And then we're going to follow on from this. And this is a story and an account that Jesus was speaking. And he said this, now on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. This is the story. And he was going, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he stood, he said, go, sorry, missed that, didn't I? Called out in a loud vow, sorry. He stood at a distance and he called, I'll get there, hang on, called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Isn't that amazing? Here's these lepers whose life was just destroyed by this disease. They were separated from their friends, their families. They were outcasts in the community. They were people that had bells around their neck. And wherever they went, they had to shout out, unclean, 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 so people could get away from them. Nobody wanted this disease. They were no longer able to have a job. They were no longer able to be in their homes with their families. And they were separated. And they came, 10 of them came together to see Jesus and to ask him for healing. And he said, go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were healed. They were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all the ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, go, rise, your faith has made you well. That's a a powerful scripture here. Who knows that when you have an encounter with Jesus, it changes your life. Come on. We, we, We learned last week, this is not just a picture of lepers that are in a bad situation, but it's a picture of humanity. We were all in a desperate state. We were in a condition that we had no way to get out of. We had no cure for it whatsoever. I want to say today, there is no cure for the problems that are going on in society today except Jesus Christ. We think we can solve drug problems and alcohol problems and addiction problems and suicide problems with all these different counseling and praise God that we've got techniques that can help people. But I want to say ultimately it comes down to one thing and that is it's a sin problem and there's only one answer for that and that is Jesus Christ. He is the answer for our communities. And when people have an encounter with Jesus, it didn't take 10 years or five years for these guys to get healed, they were healed when they had an encounter with Jesus. Their lives were changed. And I want to say today, one touch from Jesus' hand can transform your life. I know because it did it for me. My life was like that leper. I was in the gutter. My life was falling apart. There was nothing I could do to rescue myself. But I called out to the Savior, Jesus, and he lifted me up out of the gutter and put my feet on the rock as Rachel said this morning. Amen? Come on. And we've got something to praise him for because he's done that for each and every one of us. Amen? Has he done that for you this morning? Come on. If he's done that for you, you were just like that leper and he's saying, 
Only one out of the ten came back to actually praise him and thank him for what he did. Isn't that sad? Come on. Even sometimes it can be like that as Christians. We take it for granted what Jesus has done for us. We heard the scripture, it says, those that have been forgiven little love little. Sometimes we forget about how much Jesus has done for us and how much he's transformed our lives. And you might have had a good life before. And it might not be that drastically different for you now. But I want to say in the spirit realm it is because you are destined to go to a lost eternity and now you're a saint going to heaven. Amen. Come on. There might not have been a great lifestyle change for you. Or you might have been. You might have come from a background that was broken and destroyed and Jesus picked you up and transformed your life and now you're walking for him and it's a totally different life. All I know is if he's done something that tremendous for us, we ought to praise him. We've got something to praise him for. And I want to say today, even if he never did one more thing for you for the rest of your life, you've still got enough to praise him for for eternity. Come on. I don't know about you. I was on a road going to lost eternity. I was going to hell. My life seemed like hell too at that time. I was going through things in my life and it was all falling apart. You know what? Jesus came and he gave me life and life abundant. And you know what? That life doesn't start when I die. It started the day I got saved. Amen? Eternal life starts now because you know what it says in Christ Jesus when we die or when we pass on, we don't die but we merely sleep, it says. Isn't that good? We close our eyes and we just wake up like we've had a bit of a nap and we go, wow, this is awesome. You're in heaven. Isn't that amazing? Come on, we don't die. We sleep and we awaken with Jesus for eternity. We are created to give him praise. We said in the Bible, praise and worship is 527 times where it's mentioned in the Bible. I think it's important to him. I talked about a story. Somebody was in church and the worship was good and it was on and they were in the worship service and they walked out of the service and they said to the pastor on the way out, they said, it was a good service today, <clears throat> but I didn't really get anything out of the praise and worship. <clears throat> the old pastor turned around to him and said, I'm sorry about that, I didn't realise we were worshipping you. You know what, worship and praise is not about what we receive, it's about what we give. We are here to give him all the praise, all the glory and the honour. We are here to lift up his name, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is worthy to be praised above all others. Come on, when we are here, we are to lift up the name of Jesus and to glorify him. That other people might hear how great our God is. Isn't it amazing when we come to church and... I don't know about you, I've been through some tough times. And I remember there was times where I'd come to church and the only thing that got me through was sometimes even in the situation I was in, I was struggling in my own self to praise God because I found the situation so difficult. But you know what encouraged me? It was coming into the house of God and hearing songs of faith, hearing people praise the Lord and lift up his name. And even though at that time I couldn't do it, but those standing around me, lifting up the name of the Lord and declaring how good he was, was the thing that got me through the hard time. Come on. It's so important that we gather together and praise his name. And if you're not, if you're, even if you don't feel like praising him, or you're here and you're thinking, well, you know, I, I, I praise him this morning. Well, you know what? I want to encourage you this morning. You don't even have to do it for yourself. Sometimes you just need to praise him because the person next, next to you that's sitting next to you needs to hear how great your God is. They just need to get through the week and on to the next week. Amen? Come on. Praise is so important. 
talk about how we can praise man for the many things that they do, sports and accolades and those sorts of things, and we lift up the name of men and we praise them, and we should be able to praise the name of Jesus because he's done so much more for us than any person. Amen? Hallelujah. Psalm 104 to 5 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Give him thanks and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Hallelujah. That's great, isn't it? His love just doesn't last for a season, but it lasts forever. And you can praise and worship him. Enter his courts with thanksgiving. You know what? We need to be thankful for what God's done for us. Amen? Come on. Give him thanks as we enter his courts and give him praise. So why do we lift up the name of Jesus? Why do we give him praise? What's the purpose of it all? Well, the purpose all, of it all is we, he is worthy of praise, honour and glory. And we're praising him for what he has done. The side benefit of that is, as our praises go up, it says there are sweet-smelling incense to God. Isn't that awesome? And those praises go up and his presence comes down. Did you sense his presence in this place this morning? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. See, that's why it's so important to praise him. Because it brings God's presence into your situation. We heard about the story of Jehoshaphat. Where they were, had the Ammonites and some other armies coming up against them. And they would have surely been defeated. They were coming under attack from the enemy. Coming into Judah. And the prophet, they inquired of the prophet and said, well, what are we going to do in this situation? We are overwhelmed by the enemies coming on all sides. Where do we go from here? And the prophet said, I'll tell you what to do. Get the singers and the musicians and get them out in front of the army. Put them right out in the front and get them to sing and to praise God. Come on. And they did that. And they put them out in front. That would have been pretty frightening, wouldn't it? You didn't have an AK-47, you had a mate on guitar. Head into the battle. But they were right out in the front, heading out. And you know what it says? As they did that, and they praised God, they said, His mercy endures forever. And they just kept on praising Him as they went into the battle. You know what happened? The enemy got confused and attacked one another. And when they got over the hill, they didn't have to do anything because the enemy was defeated. The prophet of God said, the battle belongs to the Lord. I wonder if that's a word from somebody today. The battle belongs to the Lord today. You don't need to fight it in your own strength. You don't need to try and work out how to do it all. All you've got to do is praise him. And he'll give you the victory. Praise him to victory. Amen. I had a couple of friends of mine, the great friends. And they lived in Mount Isa. And they still do. Well, he does. She's gone home to be with the Lord. And I remember they were running an Aboriginal church in Mount Isa. George and Bev Ferguson. Lovely couple. This really spoke to me. Bev at the time was quite ill and struggling with their health, they were given a building by the Finnish church and said, you can use this church building until Jesus comes back. That's what they told them. And so they were having their church meetings there. They were living in a caravan out the back of the church and they'd been there for years. One time in winter, I went there and it was absolutely freezing and I said to them that morning, I said, how was it in the caravan? You must have been freezing. And Bev said, I knew it was cold. She said, I opened up the refrigerator and the caravan warmed up a bit. <laughs> I thought, mate, I don't know how they live in that place. They built two dongers, put money, all their money into building these dongers on the block that they could live in so his wife could have a house for the first time in many, many years. And it all, everything was looking good. But then the Finnish church owners come to him and they said, 
we decided we're going to sell the building. He said, is Jesus coming back? Or didn't know. Because they said you could have it till Jesus gets back. And then they turned around and they said, the Shire said, look, we're not going to let you plumb in those buildings. You're going to have to remove them from the site. So here they were. They no longer had a house that they thought they were going to have. His wife's um, health wasn't good. And now they were not going to even have a church building. And I remember ring, ringing him up and I'm feeling far out. What are you going to do, George, you know? Anyway, I rang him the day after this and I said, how are you going, George? He said, yeah, good. And I said, oh, all right, that's good. I said, what did you do when you heard this news? He said, all we did, pastors, we went into the church, I got on my guitar and we just praised God all night. I'm going, man, I probably would have been freaking out, stressing about it all. They just went into the church building, gathered a few people together, just started playing the guitar, just worshipping God right through the night. Guess what? It was only the day after that they got a phone call. The Finnish church decided not to sell the building. They could keep it and they've still got it today and they were allowed to plumb their house in and put it all in and it's there and it's finished today. Come on. You can take on fear and anxiety or you can take on praise. Because praise, when you start to praise God, it magnifies the Lord, makes him look so big, much bigger and reduces the size of the problem. Come on. He tells us to magnify him so many times in the scriptures. Come on, praise the Lord, magnify his name. Come on. We hear it over and over and over in the scriptures. What are we magnifying? We are making God look bigger and making our situation look so much smaller when we magnify the name of the God, Lord. You know what, over the years we've seen God do some incredible things and I learned one thing and I've learned one thing about faith and seeing God do incredible things and that is we are not called to be people that have great faith. Because the Bible says that a faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. What I've learned over the years is not that I need to have great faith. I only need a little bit of faith in a great God. Hello? I'll say that again. We only need a little bit of faith in a great God because it's as we magnify the Lord and lift up his name, he becomes bigger and our problems become smaller. Come on. You can praise the Lord into victory. So when we're talking about praise and sometimes we do things in church and we don't really know why we do them. We just do it, that's what we've always done. And So what's some of the ways we can praise the Lord? Psalms 149.1 says, Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the saints. He says, sing to the Lord a new song. One of the ways we can praise him, and you did this morning, was praise him by singing, lifting up your voice. Come on. And that's what we're doing in this place. We're not just singing for the sake of singing, but we're singing to glorify God that his presence would come inhabit this place. You might go, well, I can sense the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's living in me, and that's great. But somebody that's not a Christian coming through the door doesn't have the Holy Spirit living in them. And if God's presence is in here, they can have an encounter with God and leave this place totally different than when they came. I don't know about you, I've heard of multiple stories where people have been in church and they've heard the scriptures, they've heard preaching. But then they had an encounter with God and they knew that God was real and from that point on, they were never the same again. Come on. One encounter with Jesus will change your life forever. He says, sing a new song unto the Lord. You know what? Sometimes we struggle with new songs. We go, oh, gee, I, I don't know these new songs. I like the old songs. The old songs have got a lot more anointing on them. Ooh. Anybody ever heard somebody say that? Don't point, don't point. <laughs> oh, there's such an anointing on those old songs. They don't come out like that anymore. And you go, well, you know why they had such a powerful anointing on them for you? Because that's the song you 
was playing when you got saved. See, music is powerful. It transforms us back to the place where we first heard that song. Remember a song in the 70s on the radio would come on from the 70s. You go, oh, that song takes me back. Is that the first thing everybody says? That takes me back. Why, that connects them back to where they first heard that song. And the reality is those old songs were powerful. And people that were in that time and got saved at that time, those songs resonate with them because every time they hear them, it takes them back to the first love when they encountered Jesus for the first time. And that's powerful. The only problem was none of the young people were there back then. Hello? One other thing to note, every old song used to be a new song. That's funny how that works, isn't it? Every old song we ever sang at one stage was a new song. I was thinking about Shout to the Lord. Anybody heard that old song? Some of you think that's a new song. That came out 27 years ago. Wow. Most of the young people weren't even born when that came out. And that's Shout to the Lord. And we think that's new. I want to say the anointing to write new songs has not stopped. Come on, don't hang on to the old and forsake the new. He says, sing a new song unto the Lord. I want to say there's still an anointing and an outpouring for God to use songwriters to write beautiful worship songs like we heard today. Don't pull back because they're just not, they're a new song. And you go, I'm struggling with that. But you know what? Just press into God and worship him and lift up your voice to him. Another way we can declare with our mouth is to shout. Psalms 101 says this, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pastor. And then it goes on to the scripture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in his courts and give him praise. Give him thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 95.1 says, Come and let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. That's backing up what was preached this morning, wasn't it? <coughs> I heard a story. It was actually from Pastor Wayne Alcorn, who is now our national president. But many years ago, going back, he was the Youth Alive director. He was actually the guy that started Youth Alive within Australia. They had this big festival in Brisbane. That's where he was living at the time. And they used to have a big float parade that we used to go along down the street. So they thought, as Youth Alive director, he said, well, well, let's get a float and put it in the parade. And we'll put everybody on the back of the parade. We'll get some amplifiers and we'll play music and we'll declare the praises of God as we're going down the street. So they did that, going down and playing songs. And he said, we're going along the street. And as we were heading down the street, we looked up and he said, I saw the Channel 9 cameras. We were on TV. And he said, this is the opportunity right now to use to give Jesus praise. So he did what we used to all do in the youth groups back then. He goes, come on, we need to praise the name of Jesus, he said. Give me a J. And they went, J. Give me an a E. And he goes, E. Give me an S. And they went, S. Give me another S. Gave him another S. He said, what does that spell? And they all went, Jess. <laughs> that was right on in front of the Channel 9 cameras as they were going down. Jess was praised, but I don't know about Jesus that day. There's probably a few Jesses going, gee, I'm feeling good today. Far out. I don't know what's going on, but I'm feeling a lot lighter today. Come on. We need to be able to shout out the name of Jesus and declare his praises. Amen? Another way we can do it is clap our hands. It says in Psalm 47.1, clap your hands, all your nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. Clapping our hands is a sign of appreciation, response to excellence, or an offering of praise to God. When we just finish a song, we're not clapping 
that the musos got through without making a mistake. <coughs> Sometimes as musos you go, praise God, we are clapping for that reason, but we're, we're clapping because we're praising God. We want to say, God, we are so overwhelmed and you are so great. And if we can clap our hands to honour men in situations that kick a goal or score a hit and we're good at tennis or whatever you're, you're into and you can clap and cheer for that, how much more can we give him praise? Psalm 134.2 says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. You know what? All these things need to be an expression. Nobody's forcing you to do any of this here. You can't force somebody to worship or to praise God. If you're doing it, it says we're worshiping in spirit and in truth. It's got to come from the heart. Why do we lift our hands? It's a sign of surrender to God. Sunrise is a sign of reaching out to God. I don't know, I've been in desperate situations where I'm in the presence of God and I'm just going, God, I need more. I know the old fellows used to say, it's putting up your spiritual antennas. I don't know if it's doing that, but it's definitely pressing into the presence of God. And you might say, well, I feel awkward raising up my hands around people. But isn't it amazing? We can go to a rock concert and they'll say, everybody grab your phones, put the light on and wave your hands. And everybody is up there going... And they go, oh, that looks beautiful from the stage. Everybody's up there waving their hands and no problem with it at all. But then we come to church and say, you know, lift our hands and praise the Lord. And you go, Ooh. I want to tell you, nobody's really looking at you. You don't have to be fearful. Everybody's looking at you. I was going to say another saying I heard, but that might, no. Come on, yeah. there was a saying and it was if the whole world revolves around you it's a very little world you're living in and most of the time it's not what revolving around you just keep your eyes on Jesus amen and just just praise him lift up your hands in the holy place Psalm 63 2 to 5 says I've seen your sanctuary and behold your power and your glory because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied with the riches of foods and singing lips. My mouth will praise you. Hallelujah. We can praise him with dancing. Psalm 30, 11. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Hallelujah. 2 Samuel 6, 14 says, David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might. He came back from the battle and they were victorious and he just wanted to celebrate and he just started to dance before the Lord. Can I say something? If you're going to dance in the church... Make sure you're not shaking things that shouldn't be shaken at church. Someone shouldn't even be shaken in a nightclub. Hello? We need to be dancing. If we're going to dance before the Lord, we need to do it in a way that honors Him and gives Him glory and praise and honor. Amen? Come on. The Jews danced. They did it a lot. It was celebration time. They would get together. They would link arms and they would dance before the Lord. And just give him praise. There was festivals where they danced together and spent that time together. And I think it's so um, great when you see people can just glorify God in dance. The other way we praise him is praise him on the instruments. As we've seen this morning. You know what? When we talk to our musicians and singers here, we say we don't need guitarists and we don't need drummers. We need worshippers. Because we are called to praise God on, and use the gifts that he's given to glorify his name. Amen? That's what we're called to do. And praise God for the team we have here. But they get up and come here early in the morning and praise God, get ready and just get on the instruments and they learn, they spend time at home perfecting their craft and getting better and better at that. And that's awesome. And I praise God for everyone. Let's give all our worship team a, <laughs> an off clap. 
What you see here on a Sunday is one-tenth of what happens in, for these songs to get ready. Psalm 151 says, Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him, mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpets, with the harps and lyre. Praise him with tambourines and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen? Everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Whew. I remember we never used to have drums in church because they were of the devil. I lived in that era. You'd call it evil spirits. I don't know what they were doing back then. They had cymbals and all that there. And they were still making a fair bit of noise. My, my idea with that is when you play loud, it drives the devil away. He doesn't like, especially he doesn't like your praising God. Come on. But you know what? We're not just called to praise God here in the house, but we're called to praise God at home. Praise him in your workplace, anywhere where you want the presence of God to come. We can praise him by standing in the house of the Lord. So many times when honoured guests come, the first thing everybody will say is, please everybody stand, and everybody stands, out of respect. You know what? That's what we're doing here. When you're standing to worship God, you're showing respect to God. That's what it's about. That's the attitude of the heart or why we do it, if you don't know why we do it. You know one of the great things it says in the Bible about praise? Isaiah 61.3 says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. It's so simple. Amen? If you're feeling heavy, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling anxious, you know what you do? Put on some praise music and just let it blast through your house. It might even take the heaviness off your neighbour if he enjoys it or they enjoy it. But you know what? Just let that praise just permeate that situation. And when people are just rejoicing and praising God and they're excited about the things of God, it catches. And that heaviness that's on you, I want to tell you, that spirit of heaviness or oppression will lift from you when you start to join in and praise with him that's why we have praise and worship in our services so you you walk in here it doesn't matter what's gone on through the week if you just start to praise and worship him i want to say that heaviness will lift from you there'll be a freedom that will come upon you as well as the anointing of the holy spirit we talked a lot about praise and i just want to finish with a little bit on worship Cultural anthropologists said they were trying to disprove that there was a God. And so they declared that if they looked across the planet, they would find a group of people somewhere in a remote location, a tribe or a group of people in the Amazon or somewhere that didn't have any of the traits of God in their life whatsoever. They called it the noble savage and they reckoned they could find this group on the planet. Guess what? They searched everywhere and they still haven't found one. What they were looking for is a group of people that didn't have any resemblance of the Ten Commandments in their law. And you know what they found? Even if they went to the remotest villages in the world, they found out that they mostly had five to seven of those commandments in their own particular law. Isn't that amazing? You know why? Because they're all created in the image of God. Isn't that amazing? So there's that. The other thing they believed is they find a group of people who didn't worship a God or anything. Guess what? They never found one. Because we were created to worship God. Man was created. Man and woman was created to worship God and to glorify his name. The sad thing is today, if we are not worshipping God, we will find something else to fill that gap. Come on. We'll worship other things. You know how you tell if you're worshipping something? By your speech. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If all you ever talk about is footy, that might be something to look at. Hello? Or money. Or the latest cars. Or the... Whatever it is, if that's what's flowing out, a lot of times people are looking for things to fill that void within their life. 
But I want to tell you, there is nothing that will fill that void. You were created to worship God and God alone. That's it. That's the only thing that will fill that void is knowing God, have a relationship with God and worship in Him. A lot of people are trying to fill that cavity. They're trying to find something that's going to satisfy a lot of the time. They try and block it out. I know when I walked away from God as a young fellow for a few years, I tried everything, you know. Drinking, partying, going out, live with guys that were selling dope and drugs and all this sort of stuff and, you know, tried to fill that void and just tried to block out that voice of God. Just wanted to do my own thing, rebellious, all that sort of stuff. But you know what? Nothing satisfied until I came back to Jesus again and gave my heart back to him. Nothing satisfied. See, you were created to worship God and only one God. Amen? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Amen? The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you were created to worship him. As we worship him, Worship is a, praise is a more outward expression. Worship is more inward. It's reverence, respect, honour, devotion. The Webster's Dictionary says to regard with great extravagant respect, honour or devotion. To honour or show reverence for a divine being or supernatural power. The Greek word proskuneo means to worship, to fall down, fall on the knees in front of him, kneeling down, pay homage. Worship is quieter. It's something that is in the heart. I'm going to ask the worship team to just come back up. We might do that new song again this morning. I want to finish with the greatest form of worship that we can do. Romans 12.1 says this, scripture a lot of us would know, but would never relate it to worship. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, what he's done for us, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. How do we do it? Simple. Verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. See, the greatest act of worship today is you surrendering your life to him and saying, God, this life is not my own anymore, but I give it to you. You might be here and you've been trying to satisfy those things in your life and trying to fulfill it with different things, but there's still an emptiness there. It's only found through Christ Jesus today. Come on. It's only found as you surrender your life to him. To be a living sacrifice. You know what that is? To die to self and I'm going to live for you. It goes on to say here, and it's one of the greatest questions we, as ministers and leaders, you get asked, what's God's will for my life? How do I find his will? How do I work out what he has for me? The, the plan and the purpose that he has for me. It says it right here. Bring your life to him as an act of worship and lay it down before him and say, my life is yours, Lord. Whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do it. I'm going to die to self and I'm going to live for you from this day forward. And in order to bring glory to his name, it says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Don't look like the world looks. Come on. Don't try and fit in with the world. Light's dead opposite to darkness. It doesn't look similar. 
There's no comparison between the two. Come on. We should be shining the light of Jesus. Our, light should, our life should look so much different than the life we had before Christ. People are looking for something different. They've been out in the world and it's not satisfying. So why would they come into the church if it looked like the world? They're looking for something that's the opposite. Amen? Come on. We need to be the light of Jesus. The people can see that our life's been transformed. We're different people. And our life will bring glory to God. I want us all to stand just as we finish the service today. We're going to sing this song. You know what? It's not even something that I need to pray for you for. Salvation is not found in the sinner's prayer. I know that's hard to believe. Jesus never led anybody through the sinner's prayer. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We do that because that's what we do. But salvation is an act of surrender today. It's an act of saying, not my will, but yours be done. And God, I'm giving my life to you today. So you might be here today. And you might have been struggling and you've got emptiness or there's been trying to fill that void. But today, just surrender your life to him. That's all you've got to do today. And say, Lord, come and fill me. I receive you now in Jesus' name. Amen. And you're born again. We're just going to sing this song. And why don't you just worship God for a few minutes before we go this morning.